looking at today's devotion a little bit, I did some writing and I was, um, I'm being overwhelmed by a great sense, and that's the best way to put it, of God. Because I, you know, different times God speaks and you, God talks to me and, and Lord gives me little things, you know, kind of like cute things. It's between him and I, you know, like, uh, yeah, I'll say something like, in my mind, you know, with nobody around, you know, I'll say, you know, Lord, okay, Lord, where are, you know, and I'll think of something that, you know, I can't find, like my shoes. <laughs> you know, I'll say, okay, Lord, yeah, I can't find my shoes. Where are they? And you, bingo, instantly, right there, underneath your computer. I'm like, okay. And I trust that it's the Lord talking to me, and I've always said that because at first time that it happened, I thought maybe it's my thoughts, you know. So when I tried that before, it didn't work, you know. And then later on in life, you know, through the years, this doesn't happen like overnight. So don't get me wrong; I'm not trying to say something's coincidentally or that your mind suddenly goes into hyperdrive and you make the right connections or something. But no, I'm talking about a genuine, personal communication with God. And I don't mean that's the only way he talks to me. Sometimes he talks direct, audibly. But sometimes he talks just that way, inside. Inside my heart. In a still small way. Inside my mind, even. And uh, those times are usually just the dumb things that God and I have together. I call them dumb. God calls them personal. They're intimate and real. Or like I'll say something about, you know, I've, I've, I've gone high and low looking for my glasses. I mean, just most men know what that's like. You know, you look for your glasses, just drives you nuts. You can't find them, Lord. Where are they? You know, you kind of take them off your head. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but no, you know, and I'll go, and I'll look everywhere first. You know, I won't ask first, you know, on, on dumb little things. You know, like, you know, where's my shirt or where's my pants or where's my shoes or something, you know, that just seems silly, you know, because, you know, you look in the drawer and you're not there, you look in the dirty clothes and you're not there, and you go, oh, come on, give me a break, you know, I mean, they got to be in the dirty clothes or they got to be in the drawer, you know, because I'm not one of those guys that throws clothes all over the, the, the house or leaves them, you know, somewhere, you know, where I can find them. <laughs> Are you one of those guys? Oh, man, your wife is putting up with you, isn't she? <laughs> Come on now, guys, get a grip. Put your clothes away. Or join the military, they'll teach you how. Anyways, but the point is, is that when I lose something, you know, God has this little kind of quirky way of, him and I, you know, at some point in time, I'll, I'll give up. I just say, I give up, man, where is it? And then God will say, well, go look in the car. I'll go look in the car. Well, you won't even say go look in the car. It'll come to me in the car. I mean, I know when it's God's voice. It's very directive. It's not real. There's no, you know, question about if or, you know. I mean, it just is. That's why I go there fully expecting to find them. There they are. Oh, thanks, Lord. And I always just give it that way. You know, just, thanks, God. You know, just, and I've had to live my life that way because, well, my life has been pretty challenging. I mean, I am... I mean, before I start this, you know, video and video, say something to those that experience, you know, normal life, you know, I'm, I'm happy for you. I mean, I really am. God bless you. And I pray for people like you that, you know, you go through life, you know, you, you went through, you know, the, the normal process of having a family that prayed for you or, you know, cared for you and you got saved and you grew up in the Lord, you know, and then you're, you were the child of, you know, one of those parents that were godly and you grew up in the Lord, you know, and you went on and you're ministering and you're doing the things and, you know, your life is going and, you know, you got children and they're going to school and they went to universities and they went to colleges and they did all these things and, you know, on and on and on and on. And, you know, your life has been abundantly blessed, you know, and you're an obvious witness and testimony of your life of abundancy, you know. God has blessed you, and you've had your trials and tribulations, you know, and you've gone through your things, you know, and you teach people, and you have learned from all those experiences. God bless you. God keep you. God make his face to shine upon you. I'm thrilled. I like finding people like you, you know. It wasn't so with me, you know. And so, you know, when I look at my life as a Christian, you know, that after I got saved, all hell broke loose. You know, I always say, you know, it's kind of weird, Lord, you know. 
why did you do these things? You know, I mean, I used to say that in my early days as a Christian. But I quit doing that after about 10 years of my life because it's kind of like, I don't know why. And then after about 20 years as a Christian, I went, I know why. <laughs> then after about 30 years as a Christian, I said, thank you. <laughs> and now, after 40 years, I thank God for what I went through. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I'm so glad you took me through all that. You know, because I have experiences that maybe, you know, maybe you didn't go through. Maybe you didn't experience. Maybe you shouldn't experience some of you know, those. But no, um, not just that, but I would not, when I look back over my life, give up or change anything in my life. I mean, there have been times, I mean, I've gone to death's door, you know, and that's not a fun place to be, you know. I mean, you know, you, you think when you know what you're going to react like when you finally face death. You don't know until you're there. And you don't know how the Holy Spirit may use that at that point in time in your life. You may face death when you were young, you know, and now when you're old, you have a different fear of dying. Or if you have a fear of dying. I don't have a fear of dying. I'm like, let's get out of here, man. I'm ready. <laughs> Check out. You know, I've checked around. I'm checking out because I've already checked in, you know, and so I want out. <laughs> I'm ready, baby. <laughs> let's go home. <laughs> but, you know, for some of you, yeah, you know, you got things you cling to. You know, you got children or you got, you know, grandchildren or you got, you know, possessions or. You know, you want to see, you got obsessions, and you want to see who's going to win the Super Bowl, you know, or who's going to, you know, win the baseball tournament or league or whatever. But, you know, I mean, I, I get it. You know, I mean, there are things that some people want to see, you know. And I remember when I was younger, I kind of got a handle on, you know, when, when the Lord would probably return, and it was going to be farther down the road, you know. And I went, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and then I said, well, that means that, you know, i got to deal with life, you know. And I was kind of like, hmm, you know, and life kind of like, you know, beat the snot out of me. Because <laughs> I've had health issues all my life that have come up and gone away and done whatever, you know, as they say. You know, and God has used that because it was given it to me. You know, it wasn't something that was like a curse from the world, you know. And, oh, my God, you know, you were one of those poor people that were cursed. You know? No, it wasn't a curse. It was a blessing. I mean, and God's used it in such a miraculous way that I thank God for it. Crohn's disease, you know, it's just something that, you know, really, you know, you know, you know and I got split. <laughs> you know, and it made me who I am. And I, I, I don't know about you, I like who I am. You know, I like more so who he's making me to be. But, you know, I like who I am. You know, I mean, I'm content with the content of what God has done in my life with the portent of how he used my life in the ways that he did, at the moments that he did. Radical, yeah, you know, I mean, pretty left field in a lot of things. Now, was I a puritanical radical, like, you know, maybe John the Baptist? Heck no, man, I wasn't no ascetic, you know, I mean, I see it just as easily as the other Call me Elijah, man of like passions, you know. Well, one minute, you know, passion, and the next minute, like, oh, you know, you're blowing it. Or David, you know, oh, yeah. Look at that woman. <laughs> Woo! You know? Uh-uh. Don't look. Stop before you leap. <laughs> no. Look before you leap. Don't look. Don't even leap. Don't think about it. Go somewhere else. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. But the point being is this. With always, in always, gets me. What's got me. What holds me. What keeps me is Jesus. You know, there's just such a peace, but more than that, such a such a reality to knowing God. That if you go the extra mile, if you're if you're willing to be the Abraham, I mean, don't tell me you're Abraham unless you really have taken a child up on an altar and you know began to kill them. Don't tell me symbolically that you can somehow metaphorically, by a way of a. a symbolic gesture do something as radical and extreme as Abraham did. Until you've been there, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, until you give up your prized possession. I was taught early on in Calvary Costa Mesa by a radical teacher. You know, he kind of screwed me up. <laughs> and I blame Romaine for everything. <laughs> Romaine screwed me up. <laughs> He's dead so I can blame him. <laughs> You know, but well, Romain said something once, I'm uh, pretty sure it was Romain, 
you know, about you give your best or don't bit well. It, it was Romain. Now that I think about the rest of it, he says, "Give your best or don't give it all." <laughs> it's like what? <laughs> He'd say, "Or give it all, or don't give." You know, I mean, like what? <laughs> like what? And I did. I mean, there, there were times where maybe I should have, you know, maybe should have prayed first. You know, but Romain, you know, kind of had these, you know, neat things, you know, that was wonderful about him. You know, I mean, the man had wisdom beyond his years. Okay, maybe he had wisdom from his years. <laughs> but he was who he was, you know. And so he would say, you know, something like that, you know, and say, like, you know, give your best or don't give it all, you know. Chuck had a teaching something about, you know, when he was going through the Old Testament, teaching about uh, that, you know, if you have something that's your best, you know, you give that. You don't give, you know, and you keep the second best. You know, you give what, you know, your best was, you know. And it was like... You know, I used to take what I loved the most. And, oh, yeah, and there was another teaching Chuck had that, you know, if it didn't cost you something, you know, it wasn't worth giving, you know. And so, you know, there was a uh, another teacher at the time, I can't think of who it was that probably taught this. I'm trying to think of the styles of everybody in those days. And, and it was about sacrificial giving, but I can't remember who it might have been. Anyways, the point being was that what you love the most, you give, you know, and it was like, oh, wow, you know, and I used to do that. You know, if I had some cherished, precious little thing that I'd gotten really attached to, I give it to the Lord, or I give it away, you know, Lord say, somebody say, well, you know, they're like that, I say, oh, here, you take it, you know, and I did that with my Bibles for a long time. <laughs> it was like, no, my favorite Bible, Lord, <laughs> you know, and somebody didn't have one, and you know, I'd give up my study Bible that I couldn't afford to buy. And then the Lord would show me one in a used store someplace. I'd go, oh, you know, and I'd lust and grab it. <laughs> but it taught me things, and it brought me to places, and brought me to an intimacy with God that I would not give up for anything in the world, you know. And I like my experiences in the Lord, you know, that I've learned along the way. Just like I can bless those who haven't experienced, you know, like suffering in the way that maybe, you know, I've gone through some of those, you know, like, you know, months in the hospital, you know, where you're, you know, like dying. You know, not so good. And nobody's there, so they really not so good. You know, and nobody's visiting. Oh, really not so good. You know, even though they say they would, you know. <laughs> well, okay. You know. Lord, could you please send somebody? You know, and he sends the heathen. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> I read a lot of Khalil Gibran. <laughs> but uh, using those things, God also blessed me with them, with the intimacy and the reality of who Jesus is. And so I would be able to bring that to the table, so to speak, when we talk, you know, to bring that realization of, hey, you know what? You are going to hurt. It's going to be tough. Yeah, the world's coming to an end. Yeah, it's going to be rough. You know, yeah, things are going wrong and they will go wrong, you know, but God will still be with you and you'll get through it. You know, even if you die, you'll be through it. Hey, perfect. Get out of here. Check out line. You know, I mean, that's what I wish I was in. You know, it's like I said, boy, Lord, you know, if there was a way to get away with Christian suicide, I'd do it. <laughs> it's like, let's go home, buddy. <laughs> but, you know, we can't. We've been given a reason for the season of our lives and why we go through the things that we do. And ultimately, I want to give you the reason for all of the things you go through. I want to give you a reason for every cotton-picking little frustration, observation, consternation, aggravation, or any other Asian that you can think of, as well as all the blessings that you're going through and everything in life. I want to sum it all up for you. I want to put it all into a nutshell. And there were squirrels out this morning playing with nutshells, by the way. So that wasn't just like, you know, some kind of like inspiration. No, it was a graphic, you know, example of God working in my life today to bring to home that which he is trying to tell us in a nutshell. <laughs> and I'm not being squirrely. <laughs> Much. <laughs> but everything in your life is to bring you to the intimacy of God in your life. Everything. 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 
Three times. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. No, everything in your life. All things. Not just work together for good to those that love the Lord and call according to His purpose. It's not just working for good. It's working in your life to bring your life to knowing God. Period. Absolute. Bottom line. You want to know what the purpose of God is in your life? It's to know Him. Period. You know, the angels know Him, you know, and some of them fail, but to know Him, to put it bluntly, is like the old song said, is to love Him. Because in order for a sinful person like us to get to know Him, we have to get to be or somehow experience Jesus in a personal and intimate way. So the only way to get to know God is through Jesus. So as you begin to grow in your relationship with God in some way, whether circumstantial, whether long distance, whether intimate, whether real, whether far away, whether moving forward or back or sideways or dipping or slipping, you know, or kind of, you know, rising to the mountaintop or falling down in the valley or just kind of like, you know, winging it, you know, and bringing it, you know, and kind of like faking it till you make it or whatever it may be that you're doing as far as grace is concerned. Boy, don't that cover all the Christians. <laughs> Even then, you know, Romans used to call them like little slippery fishes, you know. You're like going upstream or you're going downstream, you know, because there ain't no two ways about it. Yeah. But, the, you know, you learn about grace, you know, after a while. And, you know, even Romain kind of like tempered some things in a way, sort of, <laughs> kind of, maybe. Okay, maybe not. But, you know, I mean, it's true. You know, he used to say that, you know, Christians, born again Christians were like, you know, trout, you know, kind of like slippery fishes, you know. God's got you and you're just kind of trying to get out of his hands, you know. It's like, you're always, you know, never know where you're going, you know, you're like a little fish going upstream. You know, if you've ever seen, for me, you know, um, I was in Alaska, so I used to see rainbow trout, you know, or trout, salmon, I should say, I've seen salmon going upstream, um, especially king salmon, but I've seen salmon that were like this tall and the water this tall. And it's kind of funny, when the water's shallower than the tallest fish, you know, he's like, you know, and, they, and they're, they're forcing it. I mean, they got some muscles. <laughs> you think you're tough and rough. Oh, man, check out them salmon. They're rotting as they're going upstream, you know, so they got to hurry because <laughs> they got rotting flesh, just like you. And your flesh is rotting, and you're carrying on. Salmon work perfectly for a good analogy if you really know about salmon, but we won't go there. So... Well, actually, we will one of these days. I should give a, I should give a massive teaching on salmon. You know what? That's a good way. Hang on. Okay, we'll do it. Yeah. It's coming sooner or later. Maybe sooner than later. But, you know, salmon, you know, are an interesting fish. You know, and I, I had the chance to you know, catch my first king salmon by sticking my thumb in his gill, but that's a long story. You know, just picking him up, you know, and, you know, about, oh, I don't know. This isn't a fish story. It was about this big, and it was about that big, and it was heavy, you know, and I picked him up with my thumb. Unbelievable! It was in a tidal pool of catch can. First fish I ever caught. Amazing, you know. It's like I couldn't catch a fish for the life of me, and yet here God gives me one. You know, I just take my thumb in and pick them up. Carried them all the way down to my sister's house to find out what it was. The king salmon. Oh, cool! You know, we ate them. <laughs> Good stuff. Made her. You know, loved catch can. Loved Alaska. You know, still wish I was there sometimes. But hey, God brought me here. So. The point of your entire life's existence is always going to be reflected back into these simple words that I'm trying to tell you right now. It's to know Jesus. So look around, get a grip, get a handle on it. Everything that's happening to you, with you, around you, and for you is about knowing Jesus. That's the bottom line. So you can either get with the program or don't. I don't really care how much you force the issue in going off on some tangent, you know, spending time in some other way. I've done that. Hey, you could try it. Take a little turn to the left. You know, we used to sing a love song. You know, see what that road has to offer you. Huh. Good luck. You know, and as Christians, you have grace. I mean, don't get me wrong. I have seen pastors even in ministry leading churches take a little turn to the left, you know, and do their own little thing, you know. And, hey, ministries have to learn too, and pastors have to learn. Pastors are people. Don't think that pastors don't make mistakes. God knows they do. I mean, whew, huh. I've helped to... You know, I don't like to say raise them up, but you know, I've been involved in ministries where God was using me into being there for their foibles to pick up some of the pieces of what the devastation is that's around them at times. You know, that's no fun. You know, because people get stomped on and get hurt feelings, hurt feelings, and get all kinds of things that happen. But the reality is, hey, we're all learning, all of us, pastor, preacher, teacher, priest.
minister, reverend, you know, man of God, man with God, woman of God, woman with God, children. We're all learning, you know, and God can use anyone at any point in time. I mean, quite frankly, because, you know, if you're not getting a message, you go use a donkey. And if you're not, the donkey can't speak, then guess what? The rocks will cry out. Yeah. Just was thinking about that. I laughed about this pastor, you know. I love this pastor because, you know, it's like, yeah. Well, I should say, it's not just this pastor. I love anyone that really says the same thing. I mean, when, when I know... When I know that, you know, it's like somebody that God wants me to be around, you know, they usually say, say things in a better way than what I say, because I've said that, you know, I said, hey, look, you know, I don't know how to tell you this, but I love creation because even the rocks will cry out and the trees are going to clap their hands, you know, and you're going to find out that there's more to these uh, plant kingdom than, you know, just plants, <laughs> because even when they did scientific studies, you know, and they hooked up electrodes to the plant, you know, I can cut this tomato plant and this uh, carnation will react to that. And it ain't vibration. So how did they react? Ooh, wait till some plant gets a hold of you, you know, and starts talking to you in the millennium and says, hey, remember what you did to me? <laughs> remember when you were cutting my hair? The grass. <laughs> I didn't like it. <laughs> kidding, kidding. Might not be that extreme, but hey, there's a certain amount of reality to that. And you know, that's what God wants to bring to us today. That's what God wants to speak to you today. That's what God wants to do with you today. He wants you to know Him in a more personal way than you ever have before today. Because today, if you hear His voice, harden not your heart. And His voice has gone out and is going out to you today. Even as you're listening to this today, God is speaking to you. He's wanting you to know Him. He's wanting you to understand Him. He's wanting you to seek Him. He's wanting you to follow Him. He's wanting you to desire Him more than you desire life itself. Because He wants you to have an intimacy that goes beyond the reality of this life. He wants you to know what it means to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Because it's not just the kingdom part but the person in the kingdom that you're going to realize because when you're in the kingdom, the only thing you can see there is God. He dominates. Yeah, he's center stage. Oh yeah. You take a look at heaven and you go, whoa, what's there in the center? Or you should... I don't like to describe heaven in the way that we normally as, I mean, as a writer I understand how most people read you know book of Revelation usually you know, and apply things according to you know like 3D even but still I know how most people image things you know and react to things because it's according to what they can see touch and feel you know according to you know a certain amount of parameters of familiarity that you have when you start talking about heaven but if you thought of it as a dimension and you thought of it as what it really is, it goes beyond our comprehension because that's why John said, oh man, I'm a man undone. Well, yeah, his cells were flying apart. He wasn't supposed to be there. It wasn't his type of environment that he could be contained until his nature was changed by the angel going and get a lump of coal and touching his lips and all these kind of things. You know, took care of him. Saved him, you know, kind of like him. Because, you know, it's the highest heaven is where he was kind of like getting in trouble. In the presence of God. Okay, you know, we saw God. I mean, you can say, has any man seen God and lived? Well, yeah. I mean, look at John. <laughs> Hello? But before that, no. After that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Dare I say, of course. But when you describe heaven, it's like, it's not so much the center as it is the... It's almost hard to be non-directional in a omnidirectional way. In other words, all contained, if you saw the sphere and you were on the outside of the sphere and that no matter where you looked, you were looking inward and yet it's not inward, it's allward, you might get it. Now, why do I say that? Well, because the eyes were in every direction, you know, and that they were reflected all the different directions of the angelic being, and, you know, I could get into it more, you know, in sci-fi sci sort of way, you know, some sci-fi guys are going to go, yeah, I got it, let's talk, you know, we're going there. 
you know, forget Star Trek, forget, you know, um, what's the other one? Star Wars, we're talking God. <laughs> it's like, yeah, man, I mean, I have a sci-fi God bigger than sci-fi. And that's why I love, you know, getting to know him in a more intimate way. Because he's so much bigger than everything I ever read or imagined in sci-fi. And that's why I kind of have some really cool ideas here. I should say, perspectives, because they're not ideas. I mean, believe me, I've thrown out all my ideas about God. I know what God says, you know, and how the reality of that can be applied in a lot of ways, and yet still fall short, dramatically, of the glory of what there is. Some people say, well, don't talk about it because if you've been there, you don't want to. And it's like, it's true. That's why I have a problem with those that say they've been to heaven and then they go out, you know, and write books and tell stories and say, well, you know, I saw so and so and I was rapping with him, you know, and japping with him, you know. It's like, no. I don't think so. I think when you've experienced heaven, like Paul, you don't talk about it. Not much. I mean, unless John, you know, you're John and you're told to by God to speak about. It. Otherwise, you don't really talk about it. You know, there's things that I don't talk about, you know, that miraculously have happened with me. You know, some things, yeah, you know, if you ask me, I'll probably talk about, you know, and, you know, personally, I'd like to share about, you know, some of the, some people call them supernatural. I call them natural for God. So it's like, to me, they're normal for God to do. You know, now they may be like, outrageously way over the top for some Christians, you know, it's like, and I agree, it's kind of like, yeah, but it just kind of expanded my thoughts about God. It's like, wow, that was mind-blowing, <laughs> literally. You know, and that's just in knowing God, you know, and that's not even like about what God doing, you know, just knowing, you know. Like, okay, try explaining that one. <laughs> well, you know, experientially, you really can't. You have to go to the Word of God and say, there it is, you know right there. You know, just like you didn't realize quite all that that meant. And a lot of people like get into Greek to figure out how that could be applicable. I like to get into God and find out how it's applicable. No offense to all the scholars. You know, I mean, I, I did my Greek studies. You know, I did my Hebrew studies. You know, I studied the words. You know, I kind of like, I get it. I got your shtick. I don't think we always got it, but you know, I understand within the parameters of when they're studying within a certain dogmatic and doctrinal way that they need to have these differentiations of the applications of the word within how they are specifically itemizing them within the reality of what they understand within their limited knowledge and base that they're using at that point in time in order to make differentiation between the word selection and usage of that within the the parameters that the Word of God exists and is for that person reading it at the moment that they're reading it. But I like to use something different than that anymore because I call it you know, integral specificity according to the scriptures and the way that the Spirit of God uses it in His way of revealing it to the person so that they would understand that with which God has written in order for that to be applicable to them in their life because it is a spiritual book or only applied to the person as they are able to comprehend it by way of the Holy Spirit opening their eyes and opening their ears to the understanding of it and the application of it in the practical way that came from a spiritual dimension that makes it reality in the way that God used it in order to manifest Himself through it to the the fulfillment of that which would be from Genesis to Revelation of Jesus himself. You got that? Sometimes I surprise myself. <laughs> they don't know me very well, do they? <laughs> you know, I mean, God's like Elmer Fudd. I mean, they don't know me very well. You know what I mean? I, I get it, you know. But you see, that's kind of where I went. Oh, God. Bigger. Okay, I got it. Just whatever, you know, I think I know about you, get bigger. Get bigger. You know, to where it was like, hey, as far as the heavens are above the earth, and so far are my thoughts above your thoughts, so far are my ways above your ears, you're not going to get it. Okay, I mean, you get what you got, you know, which is kind of like, you know, if you want to see a limitation of it in some way, which really is no limitation because you really can't get the full comprehension. Just look at Jesus and you got the physical representation of what God is, you know. Yeah, as much as you can understand in the practical reality of the world. <laughs> and that practical reality went, phew, and exploded into creation and went, wow, much more there than meets the eye. <laughs> That's for sure. Son of God will blow your mind as the Son of Man and as the Son of God. So, I always found 
God wanted me to be more intimate and real with Him than I had ever imagined. And so He took me to the place where I wanted to be through the reality of my experiences in life. And that's what God is doing in you today. He's taking you beyond your limitations to the observation of what He's trying to get to you in your way of understanding, in your current limited methodology of applying whatever may be that you're studying. May it be the Word of God, I pray. But you know, if you're reading a book, you know, about God, or if you're reading or studying in the Word of God, or you know, some theological seminary, or you're going to some, you know, Bible school, or you're going to, you know, um, church, or you know, you have some self study or some, you know, schooling of some type. God is using that. But God is also using your day, today, right now, in a simple way. Because He's willing to teach the little children, to suffer the little children to come in. To be it so simple that all you got to do is really be like a little child and they can know all about God. Beyond theologians. Really. You really can. You can go there. Because you can tell a child that, hey, you know what? If you believe in the tooth fairy, you know, and you put your tooth underneath that pillow, in the morning there's going to be a dime or a dollar or a buck or whatever it may be. And that child believes you. So why are you lying to him? I would rather tell God or tell a child about the realities of what God can do, about all the miraculous things I've seen and been through, and have that child have a full expectation of God to come through in every situation of their life to be intervening in their life all the days of their life and that, that when they went home they would know hey thanks Lord you know and they would God would say to that child well done thou good and faithful servant because you had faith and you walked according to my way according to my will according to my heart because you know I would rather that we grew up children that knew the Lord and knows the Lord than we go through the lies and you know ideas we throw at children to try to tone down and prepare them for life than to move up and grow them up into knowing God in a personal and intimate way. But that's just me. So having said that, God is going to take you through your day, every day, always, in every way, to try to get you to know Him today in a more personal and intimate way than you ever have before because He wants you to know Him. That is the sum of your life. At the beginning of your life, know Jesus. At the end of your life, know Jesus. When God gets you in heaven, He says, Do you know Jesus? And you go, Well, sort of. <laughs> oh, you know Jesus. The love of a lover. Remember that a loving master delights in the intimacy of demands made as much as he desires his followers and friends to delight in the tender, tender intimacy of his demands. Only as a result of frequent conversing with me, only as a result of talking and walking with me, of much prayer to me, of listening to and obedience to my requests, comes that intimacy that makes my followers dare to approach me as friend to friend. Yield in all things to my tender insistence. But remember, I yield also to yours. Ask of me, learn of me, seek of me. Ask not only for the big things that I may have told you, but ask the little tender signs of love too. I delight in showing you how much I care for you. Remember that I came as the world's greatest lover. I am love. Never think of my love as only a tender compassion though I am compassionate, or only as forgiveness, though I am ready to forgive, or only as loving kindness, for surely I have that. But it is that, but it is also the love of a lover, of someone who loves intimately, personally, in a way you've yet to taste of. Let me pour myself upon a lover who shows his love by countless words, constant thoughts, deeds, and things with which I will bring to you daily when you meet with me as one who loves you. In each of you, 
Remember, there is God. I am in the midst of you. It is always given to man to see in his fellow man those aspirations and qualities he himself possessed. So only I, being really God, can recognize the part of God that I am in you. For I see myself in you. Remember this too. In your relationship to others, to see I in them and they have me in them. Bless them. For you bless me. Love them and you love me. Be merciful to them and you have mercy upon me. Forgive them and you forgive them. Your motives and aspirations can only be understood by those who have attained the same spiritual level. Why you do what you do will always be misunderstood unless they are doing it too. So do not vainly, foolishly expect from others comprehension or understanding unless they are loving me as I am loving you. Do not misjudge them for not giving you that with which I have given you. Yours is a foreign language to them. Yours is an intimacy that only you and I know. Share that and grow. Be that and live. Enjoy that and follow me, the lover of your soul. get any better than that? Hello? Go. Do. Be. That's what I want to say. What can you say to that? To God be the glory of good things he has done. He has loved me. And that's the best thing I can say. Jesus loves me. This I know. It's not just the Bible that tells me so. I can feel it, feel it in my toes. Jesus loves me, this I know. Jesus loves you, yeah, you know it's true. The Son of God, you know he died for you. He rose again and will take you home too. Jesus loves you, you know it's true. I don't remember the song really, but I'll make it up and wing it as I go. Because, you know, that's what it's all about. Love and being loved. And you know what else? 